Now listen, we're going live and if you can get hurt in for real, you gotta be careful, okay? I'm not kidding you. Now when I say three, don't fool with the door, just open it up, get to the staircase on the right side. You ready? One, two, three, go. Hello, I'm Bill Burris. Welcome to this edition of Patrol. On our last program, we visited the Massachusetts State Police Academy Firearms Training Unit. There we met Trooper Mike Conti, and he explained the reasoning behind a radical change in the firearms training methodology at the Academy. He explained that firearms qualification that depends on 70% accuracy at long distances and on paper targets does not prepare an officer for the realities of a gunfight in the real world. The truth is that the vast majority of police shootings occur virtually within arm's length, five feet or less between the officer and the subject. And Trooper Connie says that even at that close range, officers are missing more than 85% of their shots. That's why the Massachusetts State Police has developed and embraced what they call the new paradigm. It's firearms training that attempts to duplicate the close quarters shooting environment that most officers are likely to encounter in a real life gunfight situation. And it puts the stress associated with firearms training right where it should be, on the threat to the officer. Join Trooper Connie now as he walks us through this new paradigm and takes us into the House of Horrors. Another part about the program that we have changed is we have eliminated uprange stress. Now what I mean by this is this. For years and years and years, while training people on the range, one of the things we did and it's, it's a very common practice with police departments, police agencies, law enforcement throughout the country, is we tried to train our people to the best of our abilities using what we had. Now, targets downrange do not present any stress to the officers shooting them. They really don't. Yes, you want to hit them, you want to hit the target, but still there's no true stress coming to you from the targets. We all know that. We all know that. Yet we also know that police officers, when they have to use their weapons, will be operating under stress. Absolutely. Absolutely. We know that. So what we tried to do over the years, we tried to do the right thing. We tried to generate stress on the range in front of our people somehow by generating it from behind our people. So you'll have people on the line, and I've done this myself. This is how I was trained. This is how I trained numerous people. It was the way it was done. What I would do, or what we would do, we would be behind them, and we would be yelling at them, trying to get them to do the right thing under stress. Hit the target! What's wrong with you? Oh, I get it, get it, get it, get it! Now, what's the problem with that? Well, this is the problem. This is the problem. This first started to occur to me years ago. I was on the stop team. I was a member of uh, the state police tactical team. And part of our functions was to run firearms training for our people. One day, I get assigned to the team, and I get some training, and I'm out there at the range. And our department at the time had about 1,200 people. So we, people used to come to the range. They cycled through every day for a number of weeks. Now, I was in heaven literally at this point. Okay? I've been in the Army. I just I love to train. I love weapons. I grew up around them. There was nothing better than, for me than to be outside. We used to have an outdoor range. We used to work at outdoor ranges. There was nothing better for me that I could think of than to be outside every day shooting. Ah, doing some shooting. Okay? It was excellent. It was outstanding. I was getting paid to do this. So I was happy, happy, happy. All was right with the world. God was in his heaven and all was right with the world because I was at the range and doing my thing. Now I was looking at the world through my eyes through my eyes, and I thought that everybody felt the same way. I remember looking at all the people coming to the range every day, day after day after day, they would come for their one day in service training. And I remember looking at them and thinking, look at all these lucky people. They get to come out here and they get to shoot and do things. And I was the luckiest one, me and my, my uh, fellow team members, because we got to do it every day. And one day, a cop came to the range, a cop that I knew. Now, this guy was a cop. He was a real cop. He was one of my role models. 
when I first got on the job. Not only was he a great investigator, but this guy was one of those people who, if you ever did the bad thing, you did not want this person coming after you because he would come and come and come until he got you. And when he got you, the case was beautiful. The case was solid, sealed. The reports were beautiful. Everything was beautiful. And when he came for you, he came for you himself. I'd seen this man do things, go in places. Ah, I was not afraid of it. He'd go in and do stuff, okay? So one day, he shows up at the range, and I saw him. I said, hey, oh, excellent. I went over to talk to him. And as I approached him, I noticed that he was visibly pale. He was pale and a little shaken. He didn't look good. He looked sick. He really did. And I went over, and I said, hey, how are you? And he said, what's going on? Are you okay? He looked that bad that I asked him, are you all right? Everything, anything I can do? Are you okay? And he looked at me, and he said, Oh, no, 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 I, I haven't slept in three days. I said, what's going on? And then, can I help you? Can I help you? And he goes, oh, no, 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 it's just it's the range, the range. I never sleep a couple days before I come to the range. And he was shaking. And I said, you're kidding. I laughed. I remember I laughed because I thought he was joking. No way that he could be all upset, all this shaking. This, this, is a, this was a cop. There's no way he could be all upset because of the range. All we're doing is shooting. I couldn't understand it. Eventually, I began to understand it. I opened my eyes up. I stopped looking at the world through my eyes. I started looking around, and I saw that there were a lot of people in my job and other jobs. I've talked to a lot of people across the country who have the same kind of response to training. Now, when we rebuilt this program, we built the whole new program, the new paradigm, we identified a number of psychological conditioning methodologies that were present within the training. Now, I am not a psychologist okay, by any stretch. So what I did is, I did my research best I could, and then I took it to a behavioral psychologist, Dr. Simone. I took it to him, and I had him review this. Now, Dr. Simone, is, he's a practicing behavioral psychologist. He does a lot of pro bono work for police. That's kind of his specialization, his, his specialty, his field that he's been working on for a number of years. He's a good man. He's helped a lot of officers over the years. And I took it to him, and I let him review it, and he told me what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. And one of the things that he agreed with was my assessment of the uprange stress, the deleterious effects of uprange stress. And what it comes down to is this. Some of the conditioning methodologies that are present any time you train people to do anything, especially when it comes to force of arms, there are some basic things that are used consistently. You've got classical conditioning, association, where you associate one thing with another. In the military, they use it with pop-up targets and the training. They associate killing, which most people do not find to be an attractive thought. They associate that with good things. You know, you get out there and you're shooting pop-up targets, and if you hit enough number of them, good job, good job, and it's good, and you've done the right thing. And they associate killing, which is a bad thing, with good things. You did a good job, good soldier. They give you marksmanship badges. They reward you. They give you time off. Okay? They associate one thing with another. We found that that is very, very present in all the training we do. Classical conditioning, associating one thing with another. Pavlovian conditioning, this type of conditioning works best. All of the conditioning principles actually work best on intelligent creatures. The more intelligent the subject, the better it works. So what I believe we have done is this, as far as this goes. And again, we use all types of conditioning. We use operant conditioning programs uh, within this you know, conditioning, just like the pop-up target, you give a stimulus, the correct response is rewarded, immediately rewarded. You will see that in the House of Horrors. Uh, but we'll, what I believe has happened is this. All these years of taking people to the range and trying to train them how to deal with stress and use their firearms, what I believe has happened is a lot of our people have begun to associate the stress from the get-go, from brand new recruits on the range all the way through in service for years and years and years of training, what they have done is, or what we have done actually, is successfully associated the stress not with what they have to deal with in front of them, but with the training itself. Because the stress has been directed from behind them to them, I believe a lot of the stress has settled on them and migrated right to the pistol. There are a lot of police officers out there who hate training. They hate going to the range. They get all nervous. They get all upset about it before they go there. They hate their guns. There are cops. And this goes against the Hollywood, the Hollywood profile of a Hollywood uh, 
the Hollywood myth that police are all gun people, they all like the guns. There are a lot of people, police out there, who don't like their guns. They hate their guns. They can't shoot with it. It causes them pain. Every time they go to the range, they get yelled at. It's a struggle to qualify. They hate this gun. This gun that may save their life or someone else's life. That is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. So what we did is we got rid of it. We got rid of it. We started with our in-service program, and now we're doing it with the recruit program going through here. I have never worked on a safer range. I've never worked on a safer range, and I'll tell you why. We have taken the stress away from behind them. We are not here. We're not here to be DIs. We're not here yelling and screaming at them. That is not our function. We are here to train them, to teach them. Everything they get from behind them, from us, is supportive, encouraging, and helping, helping them, helping them, helping them. Build their confidence, build their, build their skills. This, however, would not be effective if all we did was train them on targets like you see down here. We are preparing them to work under stress with real threats coming at them. In the real world, there is no downrange. In the real world, things can happen 360 degrees, and then you deal with it. You must deal with it. But you are dealing with it generally. The threat is coming to you, or you are going to the threat. You are dealing with it. It's in front of you. So what we have done is we built a series of programs, and a number of them provide that. We have true stress coming at our people, and they have to respond to it while they're operating with a tr in a true high arousal state with the chemical dump going through their body. And the House of Horrors is the ultimate way we have found to do that. We also use the FATS machine. FATS is a great tool. Make no mistake about it. FATS is a great tool, or any, any type of devices like the FATS machine. We have the screen, and the officers interact with the screen. But by its very nature, it is a limited tool. It is a limited tool. As much as people might get a little bit jeeped up, making the decisions, doing whatever they're doing, they know on many different levels that no true threat is coming at them from the screen. They also know they can't really get involved with it. They can't run up and grab the screen or tackle the screen. Okay? So they know this. And there are devices that they can mount on it now that shoots back a ping pong ball or whatever at you. But again, it doesn't really give you the true, true stress. So the FATS, while it is an excellent tool, it is not the ultimate tool. You need to put them into play. The ultimate is simunition. Simunition that we have found. Uh, simunition or any of the products that are similar to it, where you have officers engaging against thinking, living, breathing, moving human beings. That is the ultimate, because that is actually what we do. And we have got to train as we work. We have got to train them for the reality of what we do. That is the best way to do it. We also use this in our program. But on the firearms level, on the basic firearms level, what we have done is we have built a series of levels of training. We no longer have one or two training programs or qualification programs where if our people come through and they can put enough holes in the paper, they are deemed to be good to go, to go running and gunning out among the people. Our people. The yes against them thing that a lot of people jump into on both sides of the badge that they grasp onto, they look at the police as the enemy and the police look at the people as the enemy. What people have gotten away from, and my father told me this a long time ago, he explained it to me, you're not in the army anymore when you become a police officer. You're a member of civilian law enforcement. We're civil law enforcement. We are civilians. There are no civilians. We are all civilians in this country. If you're not military, you are a civilian. And what a lot of people forget a lot of times, and it goes back to the training too, is that we are not operating out there in a war zone. Some places are absolutely hotter than others, more dangerous than others. But we're operating out there in our own society. And the people that we're working around, they're operating around, they are us. It's our families, our parents, our kids, our relatives, our friends. It's us. So the training has got to take into account that as well. We don't want people out there spraying and praying or not operating up to their fullest potential. So what we did is we looked at it again when we analyzed it. We saw what was needed. We don't believe that one or two courses of fire where you put holes in paper is sufficient to prepare people to go out there and interact with firearms um, with the people. So we built a series of courses. We numbered them. We spent a long time. We have four basic levels that we use. And we spent about two weeks. We formed a committee, and we decided what to name them. And after two weeks of thinking about it, we came up with, we'll call them number one, number two, number three, and number four. That's what we call them. The one-level programs are basic marksmanship and safe handling skills type programs, similar to what we've been doing for years and police, police departments across the country have been doing for years. You shoot from different distances using different types of techniques and then we count up the holes in the target 
to see if you have achieved accurate bullet placement under controlled conditions. It's just to see if you get the skill level, if you understand how to do it, and you can put the rounds where you want them to go under controlled conditions. Then we move up to a number two program, which is a skill builder program. I can show you some film of that later on. I can show you some parts of that later on. Just basically, we take the emphasis off counting up the holes, and we let our people go through a firearms course where they can stretch their abilities a little bit and get more comfortable with the gun and develop their skills to a higher level. The number three program, again, we take it up a notch. We increase the level of difficulty. Number three program, running and gunning. This used to be basically where we stopped and where most, most police departments stopped. We have our people run down range with their pistol, take up a position to cover, and we have a moving target traverse across the range. A lot of things are going on here. They're using verbal commands. They're using cover. They're making a judgment whether or not to shoot the moving target if it presents a threat, and they're engaging a moving target. What we also did, we threw a wrinkle into this because we are not gamesmen. We're not out there to compete in different types of uh, competitions and win trophies. We're out there trying to save lives and not take lives inappropriately. We're out there to do the hardest thing there is. Be a cop in America today. Split second judgments. And you're going to be second guessed till kingdom come. We all know that. So what we did is we put some friendlies down range. We put some friendlies down range and the bad guy runs in front of them and behind them. Okay, the threat runs behind them and in front of them. And we're trying to get our people to open up their eyes and to think and not just spray and pray because, again, that's unacceptable. But to pick the shots and to be aware that there are other people involved because in a lot of cases there are going to be other people. We put our dummies down here and I tell everybody the same thing every day. We put them down. I say, see those people down there? That's my family down there. And usually people laugh because they think I'm just being bizarre, okay? But then I drive it home and I tell them, it's your family down there. Because you never know. Your people, your family, you might be down there and you're caught in the headlights. Suddenly you're caught in the middle of something. You've got to think about it. Do you want the police officer blasting away indiscriminately? Or do you want them thinking and if they have to use it, use it. Use their cover. Make the right judgments and not take out your family or my family. Absolutely. It is a huge thing that we do, people. It is a huge thing we do. The number four program, we call it the House of Horrors. Colonel Applegate back in World War II when he was with the OSS used this type of a training program. Now the House of Horrors has never truly left us. It, it was mutated, it mutated into different forms. Now the original House of Horrors was a basement. They set up in a basement and they would take people through to be trained and they put them through this, this dark program and they would have a gun and a knife to save their life. And they would be put through a series of situations. They would move through this thing and suddenly they would have to deal with something in the dark, under stress and under a little bit of fear. Now the House of Horrors concept has turned over the years into the Hogan's Alley, and then it turned into shoot houses, uh, whatever you'd like to call them. military calls them, kill houses sometimes. People are familiar with these. The problem with the Hogan's Alleys and the shoot houses that I have seen is this. They took the fear out of it. They took the fear out of them. Even when you move down a Hogan's Alley, things pop up in front of you and it's either a shoot or a no shoot type of a target. And you have to make a decision whether to shoot it or not. And people do it. But the truth is, because there's no fear coming to the person going through it, it is just a combat course. It is a tactical marksmanship type course. You can use your sights. You can get on your sights and use them. All the games that the Ipsic shooters play are basically that. They're games, and they're not designed to get, your, your, you get you into a true high arousal state, a fear state, and they're not designed really to train you how to use cover properly. You don't have to because there's nothing being shot at you or there's no threat coming to you. So what we did is, when we decided to do this, and we called it the House of Horrors, memory of Colonel Applegate and his program that he had, we call it the House of Horrors. We set it up in a way so it is reality-based as possible. We have our people go through this little program. It only takes about four to five minutes total time to go through the entire program. Four to five minutes. And in that four to five minutes, they make about eight life or death decisions. Boom, 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 boom. And again, it's not like a Hogan's Alley type thing because our people are being shot at as well. And we know that. We know that. It changes the whole atmosphere inside the place. It's not a game now. It's not just, yeah, yeah, do I have to shoot or not? Now it's, ah, they're going through there. We're getting 
chemical dumps consistently. We've run about 800 people through the House of Horrors now to date. Approximately 800 people. One at a time, I've taken them through. What I've learned in the House of Horrors is this. People are people. People respond in different ways, but usually very similar. The results are very, very consistent. Some, some differences here and there, but very, very consistent. I have not to date, to date I have not seen one person going through the House of Horrors and the vast majority of people I take through have been weaver trained. They have been trained to fire like this, to do all the shooting like this. I have not seen one person going through there go like this when they encounter an engagement. Ha! Ah! Not one of them. Not one of them. They all do what human beings do. They see the threat. Ha! Ah! They do this. They square themselves to it and they're looking right at it. Right at it. In about four or five minutes, they make eight life or death decisions. When they finish, that's when the real training takes place. The House of Horrors, the way we have it set up, is multidimensional. The benefits that can be derived from this simple program are phenomenal. People not only go through and can be conditioned to use proper judgment or to be rewarded to, when they use the proper judgment, they're not only conditioned to operate better under stress, under the types of, in the types of situations that police officers find themselves. They do that, and we do that. We condition them while they're in there, and I can go into depth on that later. But what people also begin to understand is, like I said earlier, about looking through your own eyes, you can tell people all day long about tunnel vision and auditory exclusion and the chemical dump and the effect it has on your body and about memory gaps, and people will sit there and go, oh, yes, 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 I understand. But they don't. They don't truly understand. We don't understand until it happens to us. People learn best through experience. So what this does, this is experiential learning, the way we have it set up here. What it does, it gives them a chance to feel it and experience it for themselves through their own eyes. To date, I have had a 100% success rate taking people through the house of horrors. And as far as success rate, what, I'm, what I mean by that is 100% of the people I have taken through there have felt that chemical dump. We have achieved the chemical dump in these people, every one of them. They first start to become aware of it right after the program ends. They're still inside the House of Horrors. They're in the dark. I have been with them the whole way, myself or another instructor, walking them through it. And you're right on top of them. And the first thing I ask them is this. Okay, you tell them they're done. They're done. They're done with the course. And they go, oh, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. And a lot of times we get, yeah, you're done. And they'll just Okay, thanks. And they walk off into the darkness. They're all jeeped up. They're all, that's one of the first things that lets us know they're jeeped. They walk off into the darkness, don't even know where they're going. That happens all the time. We call them, come back, come back, come back. And they come back. And I look at them and I'll ask them a question. I'll say, how do you feel physically? And they'll be breathing. <sighs> and they'll say, okay, I feel okay. And I'll ask them this. Wasn't I with you the whole way? And they'll say, yes. How come you're breathing like that, but I'm not? And suddenly it dawns on them. It's not a physical thing. We're not wa running through this. We're walking through it. But they're breathing hard. They're tight. Some of them are sweating. Some of them are jeeped up. Okay? The vast majority of them are jeeped, but some of them more than others. Some people get a better chemical dump than others. The adrenaline junkies who come through, the people who do it all the time, they love it because they get a fix. Ah, they come, that was great. I want to do it again. Okay? So it gets that. We, we can achieve that. And I tell them to look at it and to feel the physical effects, the physical effects of the chemical dump. And they get it, and they get it. And most people have felt it at one time or another, especially in the police industry. Then the real learning begins. And I tell them, now that you can feel it in your body, you can see the effect the chemicals had on you, now we're going to see what the chemicals did to you mentally. And they go, OK, OK. And we take them over, and we walk them through, and we just do a quick debrief, a quick critique on what they did. What did you see? What did you do right here? And they tell you different things, and then you show them and suddenly it makes sense. The tunnel vision makes sense because they experienced it. What did you do here two minutes ago in training? And they will tell you, they will go like this, they go, I have no idea. It's gone, it's just wiped away. Memory gaps, memory gaps. People who walk out of this, especially investigators, when investigators walk out of this, seasoned investigators walk out, they go, oh my God. When I think about all the people I've interviewed, all the witnesses I've talked to over the years, and they seem that they were all messed up, and I didn't think they were telling the truth. I thought they were lying. They didn't remember this or that, and they didn't see this or that. They didn't hear this. They didn't hear someone yelling at them right here. How could you not? How could you not? Suddenly, they get it. They walk out with a new understanding. 
I've had investigators come back to me just in the short few months we've been running the program, come back and say, I was interviewing someone the other day, and what they were saying, I finally understood it. I was right with them. I understood that they weren't lying. Memory gaps, 85 to 90 percent of the people we put through the House of Horrors, our four-minute program, experience at least one major memory gap, totally not remembering something just happened. This is very significant. Again, what we're trying to do is let our people understand what happens to the human being under stress. Perhaps we can eliminate in the future officers showing up at scenes, second guessing the officer, how did you not know, how could you not see, how do you not remember this in thinking that they're lying. It just happens. It's part of the human condition. And we need more people on both sides of the badge to understand what does happen. You and I went through this thing at the same time, same speed, right? Yes, sir. How come you're breathing like that and I'm not? I was dealing with the stress right in front of me. That's right, you're dealing with the unknown, I know what's down here. That tells us it's not a physical response, it's a chemical response, correct? Sorry, sir. It's your body's physical response to the chemical dump. You probably got about 41 of those chemicals we talked about, all right? Sir, I believe so, sir. I'm gonna say clean shaven. Okay, fat, thin? Uh, I'll go husky. Husky, okay. I'm on the heavy side. Okay, clean shaven. You know he's a cop, though, because you saw what? Saw a badge. Sure. Okay, let's go take a quick look. Did he move? Did he talk? Did he do anything? Didn't move. Didn't move at just all? Just from once I popped the door open, yeah. first thing I saw was just the badge. Just, the just standing there? Just standing there. Just standing there? Okay. Didn't hear anything. Okay. Didn't all see right. him move. Again, now you become a little bit selective, all right? You got a little bit of adrenaline dump here. It's really starting to percolate. This is what you saw. He, light, he lit up. He was lit up, too. He was backlit. He did turn. He turned on you just like that. And then you saw him. You don't remember moving, all right? Not at all, sir. See the holes in his body? <laughs> Did you shoot him? Sir, no, sir. Did you experience it now? That is a training memory. Mm -hmm. It's a training memory, not a true memory. A lot of people remember having two hands in the gun because that's how they train. A lot of people remember using their sights because that's right. how they train. But in reality, you didn't have two hands. You had one hand in the gun. Okay. Do you believe me? <laughs> you were behind me, yes. I wouldn't believe anybody, yeah. okay? Yeah. I can show you. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Use your finger gun and show me how you shot. Here. What did you do? I just pulled in. Right yeah, like and how many hands do you have in your gun? Sir, one, sir. That's right, that's right, okay? And again, most police shootings go down, one hand yeah. in the gun. You're doing something else, you're holding something or whatever. Good, good. What did his face look like, this guy with the knife that you shot? I had a beard. Full beard or a goatee? Okay, full beard. Good man, good, 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 good man. Okay. Now, tunnel vision is one of the effects of stress, yes? Yes, sir. Your brain's looking for information to make a decision. It locks in on different things sometimes. I'm gonna show you what you saw and what you didn't see. You did really well, it's a little bit of tunnel vision, okay? Ready? Sure. This is what you saw. Look a little different than you remember? Oh, definitely. Yeah? Now, this guy must have shaved, but he does have a knife. Maybe he shaved. Remember his little beard you told me he had? Yeah, okay. that was a little beard. Yeah. <laughs> but that's normal, again, you know, you're locking him in that way. Did you use your sights here? Sir, no, sir. Why not? I didn't have time. You do have time. You actually do have time. Everybody says the same thing. There's no time. It's too close. It's too fast. You do have time. You really do. You get about it two was seconds. natural just to, yeah. just to come up, point, and go. Yeah. Well, because you've been training that way, too. But here's the thing. The reason we had to change the training, the reason you did the what you did here is not so much because of the training you had, mm -hmm. but the training you had is because of what you did here. This is what we actually do. This is how things go down with police. Close quarter, low, light, fast, and furious. More emphasis has got to be put on the training and proper training, preparing our people not just to be able to get the gun out and make it go bang, but to do it under stress and to do it only when it's right, when it's appropriate. Uh, will we make mistakes? Of course we'll make mistakes. But by using this training program and using these types of training programs, we will limit those number of mistakes. We will make fewer mistakes. And the fewer mistakes we make, the more lives we save on both sides of the badge. Trooper Connie says the House of Horrors is designed to be easy to replicate. And the shoot, don't shoot scenarios are easily changed to provide a fresh set of challenges each time an officer goes through. The Massachusetts State Police Academy is offering an instructor's training program that is open to any and all departments around the country. Any officers wanting to take part can stay at the MSP Academy free of charge, and there's no charge for the training. If you're interested, contact Trooper Conti at area code 508-867-1559 or call the Academy at 508-867-1000 and ask for Pat Sagan. I'm Bill Burroughs. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Patrol.